And happy Mother's Day, as is uh, very common in a lot of churches across the country. We will be talking about mothers. Specifically, we'll be talking about parenting today. So this is QX Church. You find us online at qxchurch.org. I am Scott Conway. And we're going to talk about QX parenting and self-leadership. Now, one of the things that typically happens on Mother's Day and Father's Day is there's a message having to do with parenting, a message having to do with being a mother, a message having to do with being a father. Sometimes it's specific to mothers, sometimes it's specific to fathers. And when that happens, sometimes if you're not a parent or if you're not that particular sex parent, it kind of sometimes feels like this message just really isn't for you. Well, one of the interesting things that um, is true about parenting is that a lot of parenting is leadership. I mean, there may not be a lot of leadership in, you know, changing a diaper and feeding a child, but a lot of the principles of parenting are the exact same principles in leadership. And what we're going to talk about in this series is parenting and self-leadership. Because very often some of us have, you know, perhaps not had the, the greatest childhood, but regardless of whether or not that's true, as we become adults, some of the exact same principles that apply to parenting also apply to the way we approach our own lives as, in a very real sense, we become our own leader. We have to make our own decisions, and the exact same principles that apply to parenting can help give us guidance on doing exactly that. So in this lesson, we're going to talk specifically about parenting. In the next two lessons, we're going to talk about self-leadership using exactly the same verse. Now, the verse we're going to be working from for three weeks, yes, one verse, three weeks, there's a lot in here, is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Now, if you're turning to this in your Bible... Uh, Proverbs comes after Psalms. And so you're going to go through Old Testament history, get to the beginning of New Testament po or Old Testament poetry, and it's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then it's before all the prophets. So if you're in the prophet, back up. If you're in history, move forward. Psalm chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Now, as simple as that statement sounds, there's a lot of stuff in here. You can take this one sentence, train up a child in the way he should go. And from that statement alone, take an entire parenting philosophy. So train up a child. What does it mean to train? Well, there's all sorts of training. Sometimes it's raise up a child, or whatever it is, you are specifically attempting to produce an outcome. There's a lot of different ways you can train up a child. There's a lot of different ways you can train generally. Train yourself. Train employees. Train your children, of course, for the context that we're in here. One of the most powerful ways to train up a child is actually passive training. Passive training is being a good example. So passive training is example training. That you show your child things, you show your child how to do things by being an example. By having an example in front of your child. Now, I will warn you, there is a danger of doing 100% example with no explanation. And that's that the child may misunderstand. So, for instance, if I'm being a good father, and part of the thing I do as a father is I leave for work every morning, and then I come back from work every evening. Well, my child may not understand that what I'm doing when I leave is I'm producing income to take care of the family. All a child might know is the example of a father who wakes up every morning and leaves. And so sometimes the example requires explanation. And so when you're doing passive training, when you're being a good example, one of the things we say is be a good example, explain the example you're being. So you demonstrate what you would like your children to pick up, and you explain what you're demonstrating so that your child can understand what's going on. 
Now, one of the things to remember when you're doing passive training, when you're doing example level training, is that you are teaching a child by your example, by and large, up until about the age of seven. So somewhere between six and seven years old, typically, children stop just simply imprinting, and then they become parent-referenced. But what this means is that until that child's about seven years old, they're just sort of absorbing things from around them. Now, this is probably evident in no place more strongly than in language. So think about how you watch a baby go from not being able to do anything much more than just cry to being able to make sounds, to being able to make words, to being able to speak sentences, to be able to communicate with you in English. And how amazing that is. And if you use your child's absorption of the language, absorption of pronunciation, absorption of vocabulary, absorption of ways of thinking and ways of communicating as your measuring stick to understand your child is just absorbing these things at this point. And they're not just absorbing language. They're not just absorbing vocabulary. They're not just absorbing accent. They're absorbing how they observe you interact with life. They're observing how they see you interacting with one another. They're beginning to absorb their understanding of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be married, what it is to be a family, what it is to be husband, to be wife, to be mother, to be father. They're just absorbing all of this in the same way they're absorbing language. And so if you see how a child goes from birth and is ready for first, second grade, and you see all the things they just sort of pick up, all the things they just sort of figure out on their own to understand that you are passively training your children and their acquisition of language is your warning, your flashing light to remind you I am defining the universe for my child by my example. I am defining how things work and what things are by my example and by the explanation of the example that they are seeing. Another level of training is incidental training. Now, incidental training is enormously powerful. Now, besides the power of the passive training, the power of being an example and explaining the example that you're being, incidental training is based on approval and disapproval. Children learn very early to determine whether something's okay or not by whether they get approval or not. Whether something's not okay or not by whether they get disapproval or not. Now, this parent reference approval, disapproval, has a tendency to last until somewhere between 12 and 14. Typically, as a child passes through the tween years and they're going into the teen years, they will shift from being parent referenced to being peer referenced. So they're going to start doing this approval, disapproval thing related to their peers, related to their friends, related to the people that they see as their equals, related to the people that are now becoming more important to them. But until that time, they tend to be more parent reference, and they will determine how they're doing by whether mom or dad approves, by whether mom or dad disapproves. And so this is incidental training. So it's not just passive because you're doing something. You're doing something possibly on purpose, possibly unaware, but it's active. But it's incidentally active. So on the approval, disapprovals, one of the things you have to be careful of is that there are sometimes bad things children can do that are cute. And this gets to be a problem because it's just adorable sometimes in the little one. And it's comical, it's entertaining, but it's not something you want your child to grow up doing. But at a very young age, sometimes they get this idea that this is a good thing. One of the ways I've seen some families just think that children can be absolutely adorable is they'll like put their hand on the hip and they'll stomp their foot and in kind of a, a very sort of 
cutesy adult fashion, they'll make some kind of whiny declaration or some kind of bossy declaration. And because, you know, in, in a three-year-old or even a two-year-old or a four-year-old, they really don't have any authority. And so it's just kind of entertaining. And if the child mistakes you being entertained as approval, then they're learning to do this. And they're learning this is the way things get done. Part of approval or disapproval also is whether it works or not. So if I take a child into a toy store and the child wants the toy and the child doesn't know what to do and so, you know, typical of children, the child pitches a fit and gets the toy. Well, that toy, do that child feels like approval. Like, I'm trying to figure out how I, how I do this, what works, how does the universe work, and even though you might complain, even though you might put up a resistance, even though you might say no at first, even though you might reprimand, even though you might even threaten the child, like, I'm warning you, if you, if you don't stop, something's going to happen, and then it doesn't happen, and then the child gets the toy. That is taken as approval. Because the child's going, well, I want the toy. Well, let me try this. And then it works. Obviously, you approve because you decided to let this work. Also, then with disapproval is when children feel their parents disapprove. It doesn't work. It doesn't get the child their way. Then the child learns to not do that. Now, especially where the incidental training of approval and disapproval gets to be a problem, is that sometimes we don't have consistent values. Sometimes we're not functioning at the principle level. Sometimes we're not functioning at the logic level. Sometimes we're just being emotional. And sometimes that emotion is being driven by something that has nothing to do with our children. But the children don't know that. So all the child knows is, well, I do this and mom's happy and Sometimes I do exactly the same thing, at least I think it's the same thing, and, and mom's upset. And they don't know what that means. They know, well, sometimes I'm in trouble, and, and, and sometimes it's okay, and, and sometimes mom likes it, and, and then the same thing on disapproval. And it may be that we're responding to work. It may be that we're responding to friends. It may be that we're responding to other events in our life. But the children don't know that. I mean, think about how many children, if their parents get divorced, think that it's their fault. This is very common. And so we have to pay attention, try to just be conscious of the incidental training of approval and disapproval that we're giving our children. Also, in train up a child in, in the way he should go, we have active personal training. Active personal training. That means active, we're doing it on purpose, that we're doing something, we're taking action, and it's very personal to our child, and it's training. And these are things you teach on purpose. So you might teach your child on purpose how to clean a bathroom, how to do the dishes. And anybody who's ever taught this to a child knows it is just way easier just to do it yourself than it is to teach a child how to do these things. You might be able to clean the bathroom all on your own in five or ten minutes. It might take you half an hour to teach this child how to do it. And the next time your child does it, it might still take you half an hour to teach your child how to do this. And another ten minutes for you to go back and clean up the bathroom again so that it's actually clean after your child has made some of their first halting attempts. And this is what we call normal. But these are things you teach on purpose. On purpose, you might teach your child how to do laundry. On purpose, you might teach your child how to do dishes. On purpose, you might teach your child how to set a table. On purpose, you might teach your child how to make a bed. On purpose, you teach your child how to tie a shoe. All of these things that you teach on purpose is active personal training. Now, there's a lot of day-to-day -day skills. We just sort of expect we're going to be actively teaching these to our children on purpose. As we ponder... Sometimes the incidental approval, disapproval training that we've done, the, the passive example and explain the example you're being training that we've done, sometimes we might want to consider purposefully teaching our children things that might not occur to us. So for instance, what is your child going to need to know how to do when they move out on their own? 
They're going to need to know how to pay bills. Have you ever taught your child how to pay bills? Have you ever taught your child how to balance a checkbook, how to do a budget? Have you ever taught your child what bills there are to run a household? Or might they move out and they just say, well, I have enough money to pay rent. Well, do you have enough money to pay for utilities, to pay for your water, to pay for your electricity, to pay your gas bill? Do you understand that, you know, that uh, television, the internet streaming, all that has a cost to it. It's not free. Do you understand renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance? Do you understand what it takes to make a purchase? Do you understand vehicle maintenance? And it doesn't necessarily have to be that every child needs to learn how to change their oil and, and how to necessarily fix a flat, though that one I certainly recommend. But just to know that vehicles need to be maintained, that they need to be taken in to have their oil changed, they need to be taken in for tune-ups and that they know how to do that. Do your children know how to handle an insurance claim? Do they know how to handle an accident if someone hits them or they hit somebody? And what information to exchange and how to do that? Do they understand how to handle a ticket if they get a ticket? All of these things that our children as adults will need to know how to do. Does it even occur to us sometimes that this is something that might require active personal training, something that we will teach on purpose? Very often, it just doesn't occur to us. It's not that we don't love our kids, obviously. It's not that we don't want them prepared for adulthood. It's just, we just don't think about it. These are things that very often, you know, maybe we learn just when it came up. Sometimes we might realize that if it's never come up in our own personal life, we might not even know how to do it. There's a lot of adults that don't know how to change a tire. Now, if they got a flat while they were out driving by themselves, they wouldn't know what to do. They just have to wait for someone else to stop and someone else to help them. So active personal training, things you teach on purpose, just ponder, what is it I would like my child to know how to do? Do I want my child to know how to follow a recipe? Do I want my child to know how to put in a job application? Do I want my child to learn how to deal with a bully themselves? Do I want my child to learn how to deal with creditors? Do I want my child to learn how to dot, dot, dot? Whatever it is. And you just start thinking through your child's adulthood, their teenagehood, their tween years, their elementary school years, and just ponder what are they likely to run into? And what can I do to have them ready for that before it happens? And in a lot of cases, we might think, well... This is something we just sort of deal with when it comes up. Other things, these are things that we might want to deal with way beforehand. Another aspect of training is active delegated training. Active delegated training. Active delegated training is things you have others teach on purpose. So when someone you know, brings a child to me for karate lessons, that's active delegated training, that they are delegating the training of karate of their child to me. And they bring the child to me and say, Scott, here's my child. Will you please teach them karate? Sometimes we do active delegated training for some elements of spirituality. We say, okay, church, here's my child. Put them in Sunday school, teach my child about Christianity. Active delegated training can be lessons that you pay for, like karate lessons. Active delegated training could be lessons that you just take your child to, like Sunday school, whether you're, you're a tither or not, whether you, you do tithes and offerings to the church or not, or financially support the church or not. Active delegated training means that you're thinking about what do I want my child to learn, and I want to buy them lessons to learn. You want your child to learn guitar. If you play guitar, maybe you can teach your child guitar. If you don't play guitar, you'll take your child to guitar lessons, to piano lessons, to music lessons, to gymnastics class, to ballet class, to karate, to jiu-jitsu, to a weapons class. Whatever it is you want your child to learn, active delegated training means you will find an instructor, you will find someone who can teach this to your child, and you will take your child to that person or have that person come teach your child. So that's active delegated training. Closely related to this is involved delegated training. So active means just that you're doing it, things you have others teach on purpose. Involved delegated training also means that you have others teaching your child on purpose. 
things others teach on purpose and you monitor. That's your involvement. Now you might monitor because you're taking lessons at the same time. I certainly highly recommend the parents come train with their children. So when your child's old enough, they're not just in the little kids class, now they're in the adult level class, which a child can sometimes be doing as young as seven or eight, at least in our program. And in some programs they can start off there. But if you have a child start at, say, the age of four in the little program, and at five or six they're in the junior program, and at six, seven, or eight they can move into the adult program because they have experience. Or if they're, you know, ten years old or older, they can start in what we call the adult program or the family level program. As part of involved delegated training, you could do it with your child. Involved delegated training, you could not necessarily do it with your child, but you could show up and observe your child learning these things. So things others teach on purpose and you monitor. Now I do highly recommend you do this with your children's education. Chances are you don't handle your children's education. Obviously if you're a homeschool family, you do handle your children's education. But unless you're a homeschool family and you are personally educating your child, you probably have that delegated, maybe to a public school, maybe to a private school. The involved delegated training means you pay attention to what your child is learning. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll sit down and go over every single little thing. But especially when you know the philosophy or the ideology of the teachers may or may not line up with what you want your child to learn, you will monitor more closely or less closely based upon where you might see the differences. And then as needed, you will do some of these three things. One, compare two, contrast, and three, correct. Compare, contrast, and correct. So involve delegated training and things others will teach on purpose. So the, the instructors are teaching your child on purpose, whatever their curriculum is, whatever either you sent your child to or your child's in, and you will compare, contrast, and correct. Now what compare means is you will add something else side by side to what your child is learning, and Look for similarities. So compare is adding something side by side and looking for similarities. What else is like this? Now this helps you expand what your child learns, expand what your child understands. So your child understands, this isn't just this, this one thing and you learn this one thing. That you can compare it to other things and let your child understand that so this one thing you're learning here has some other corollaries. This one thing you're learning here has some other implications. This one thing you're learning here has principles in it that applies to other areas. One of the things I will sometimes remind young people of when they're learning math, and they're learning math at a level that, yeah, honestly, they're probably not going to do math. If they go into engineering, they might need that level of math. If they're going into some sciences or mathematics, they, they might need that level of math. But for the most part, day-to-day -day life, yeah, nobody needs trigonometry. I mean, when was the last time you had to do trigonometry in your ordinary day-to-day -day life? But unless it's part of your profession, you probably have never needed trigonometry or calculus or any other you know, high-level mathematics, even at, at a high school level. But one of the things I teach is a comparison. That there's a very systematic, logical way of thinking. That there's an order to the universe that mathematics reveals to you. And as you learn how math works, as you see how high-level math works, as you see how complex math works, you begin to understand that the nature of the universe at a different level, that sometimes, even though things might look confusing, even though there might be a lot of variables... In a similar way to math, there's ways to figure stuff out. And the math of figuring stuff out mathematically helps you understand how you can figure stuff out in your day-to-day -day life. So while you might not use differential equations ever in your ordinary waking life, the way of thinking where high-level sophisticated mathematics helps you understand how you figure things out, you be, can begin to start looking at your own life in terms of variables and figuring out range of variables and you know, there's all these different things that feed into whether or not this is going to work out. And you begin to see things in terms of expressions and equations. And by the way, the difference between an expression and an equation, an expression is a mathematical way of defining something. 
And so if you're going to say something along the lines of, you know, this mat is 10 feet by 10 feet and has 100 square feet, that you're expressing something mathematically. And so you're defining it by math. When you say that 10 times 10 equals 100, that's an equation because there's an equal sign in there. And so you can compare things to help them understand this is more important than just the thing. You know, PEMDAS, that you do parentheses first, exponent second, multiplication and division, and then you do addition and subtraction. You know, order of operation. You know, how often does that matter? I mean, very few of us deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. It might come up on a trivia question of, you know, total this up, and then we realize, okay, if there's a parenthesis, we do the parentheses first, if there's exponent, we do exponents first. We do our multiplication and our division after that. We do our addition and our subtraction after that. So then you get the right answer. Well, this whole concept of order of operation that also can guide you in life. Is there an order of operation to solving a particular problem? Is there an order of operation to how are you going to approach a relationship difficulty? Is there something you need to do first before you do something else? And if you don't do this first, you're going to end up with the wrong answer. This concept of having an organized, structured way of approaching things is helpful. And then as you get more into this whole PEMDAS concept, you get in a higher level of mathematics, you begin to understand that multiplication and division are the same. You begin to understand that a fraction isn't just a fraction, it's a division problem. And you begin to understand that addition and subtraction are the same. That, you know, at first you're going to start off with, you know, addition is one thing and subtraction is the opposite. Eventually you begin to understand that addition and subtraction are both addition. You're either adding a positive number or you're adding a negative number. You begin to understand that multiplication and division are the same thing, that division is just a multiplying by a fraction. And as you begin to learn, you're like, oh, okay, even though this looks opposite, it's actually the same. And that there's ways to, to make what looks opposite into the same by doing a conversion. So 10 divided by 2, it's a division problem, equals 5. You could do that as a fraction. 10 over 2 equals 5. It's a division problem. You could do 10 times 1 half equals 5. You go, oh. So what looks originally like the opposite of multiplication, it's a division problem, you begin to learn by comparison You've added something else side by side looking for similarities that there's ways these things are the same. And as a child grows up learning this, they are better equipped to deal with life because they realize, okay, so I learned this one thing and now I know ten things. Now contrast is adding something else side by side and looking for differences. Adding something else side by side and looking for differences, and that's a contrast. So as you're doing contrast, very similar to how we were looking at math, you might add something else that might look like it's the same in some ways, but also take note of how it's very different. Now this is going to be very true often in the social sciences. This is going to be very different when you talk about moral equivalency. Now in um, a Christian realm, there was this idea that was being presented, which, you know, honestly, to me and to probably most of us here, seemed pretty bizarre. And the, the statement was this. It was actually in black and white in a book that was very popular in Christian circles, talking about male struggle with pornography, and in particular, on this issue, it was talking about raising children. And what it said is that a PG-13 movie is the moral equivalent of having sex with a deacon's daughter in the backseat of a car. So, okay. A comparison was just made. The contrast, though. You might sit down, if, if your son comes home, and this is what they've learned, and they say, we can't watch a PG-13 movie. A James Bond movie in particular was used as, as a comparison here of of how, you know, when the boy sees dad watching a James Bond movie, that's the moral equivalent of. 
So you might want to do a contrast on something like that and say, okay, let, let's take this thing side by side. They say it's morally the same. Well, let's look at this and see if that's true, what else must be true? If it's the same, what else therefore must be true? Now, in particular, what this means is not only, this is the point they're trying to make, does it imply that if you wouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this either. But there's the flip side. That if you really don't think there's a problem with this, well, then you just said there's not a problem with that. And so if you're watching a PG-13 movie, and there's a lot of those out there, and you really think, well, that looks fine to me, then what this teacher accidentally said, and you want to build the contrast for this, is that if the PG-13 movie really honestly is just fine, well then therefore, the backseat of the car must also be fine. And so contrast is when you add something else and you look for differences. Now you can do compare and contrast, where you're going to look for what's the same and what's different. Why would they say this is the same and what is the same about it? And why is it also different? Or why would they say something's different and also take note of the ways it's the same? So compare and contrast. Now the big one to watch out for is to correct. To compare, contrast, and correct. Now, when you're correcting something, you're saying something is incorrect, and then you're teaching the correction. Now, this isn't just criticizing or critiquing. That's just saying that, oh, that's bad, that's wrong, don't do that. Correction is, this is wrong, what's right is, and you introduce your child to what you believe is the correct answer. Now, one of the things I strongly believe in is that when you do a correction, you need to explain why something is wrong. Not just it's wrong because mom said so, but here's the reasons why it's wrong. You might even add in, and here's the reasons why people believe it, even though we believe it's wrong. And this is what we believe is right. And this is why we believe this is right. Now, when it comes down to moral issues in particular, the whys are important. Because you're teaching your child to be able to reason through some of these on their own. And so when you offer a correction, instead of just criticizing, that's bad, we don't like that, we don't believe that, that's not true. Offer the correction, the, the information, offer the reason why. So not just criticism, correction and the reasons why, not just the conclusion. The conclusion is just, no, 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 that answer is seven. It's like, okay, but why is the answer seven? And you teach your child how the answer is seven. So correction is saying something is incorrect. Now that you can just do in criticism, but then you also teach what is right. You teach the correction. And instead of just teaching conclusions, also teach the reasons why. Now, notice so far in our verse, Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. How much of this have we dealt with so far? Train up a child. That's as far as we've gotten. We're just talking about train and the way you train. Now, if you've already noticed, and we're going to talk about this in more detail next week, how many of these things is there a version of it that we can apply to ourselves? And we're going to dive into some of that next week. So now let's continue past the third word in the verse to the way and he should go. So train up a child in what? The way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the way. So the way includes a path. So one of the meanings of the way is a path. A path is simply a step-by-step -step system. School is a path to follow. You're going to go to kindergarten, you're going to go to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth, sixth grade. You're going to graduate from high school. You're going to go to college. You're going to go to grad school. I mean, this is a path. And somewhere along the way, you're going to get off the path, and you might train up your child in the way they should go in the path. Say, okay, this is the path you have to follow. And you have to go at least to 12th grade. And then you can get off if you like. Or you might teach your child, you go to 12th grade and then you go to college. And that you must go to college. 
and that you must finish an associate's degree, or you must finish a bachelor's degree, and that that's where you get off. You get off at, at a degree. Or you might teach your child, you know, that in our family we, we go all the way to graduate school or, or law school or medical school, whatever level of higher education is, and you, you get on this path and you walk out the path and here are your offerings. You can get off here, you can get off here, you can get off here. Step-by-step -step system. A career path can be a path to follow. That you might teach your child, you know, here's where you start off. You know, you can start off at this level and then you step it up to this level and you're looking for a job, you know, in, in supervision and then in management and you're working your way up and, and that this is a path you're going to follow and you're working on. A path of religious involvement can be a path to follow. Then you, know, you attend church, you go to Sunday school, you get involved, you do your tithes, you do your offerings, you, you teach Sunday school class, that you start getting at higher and higher levels of involvement, you serve as an altar boy, whatever it is, the path of religious involvement, how you're going to step that up. A romance path of dates to dating, to courting, to engage in marriage can be a path to follow. You might train up your child in how a relationship walks itself out from hello to I do. And that can be a path to follow. Another uh, version of the way is a system of doing things. A system of doing things. A system of doing things can be as simple as a technique. A technique such as measure twice, cut once. Where you teach your child a system of doing things that when you're doing things you always want to say, err on the side of caution. Build in a margin of error. So if you're going to measure twice, cut once, and you're not 100% sure, maybe it's measure twice, cut once, always add an inch. And then when you go to fit it in, then you trim off until it exactly fits. Whatever the technique is you're going to teach is relevant to what it is you want your child to learn. So teach them techniques. Teach them systems of doing things. A system of doing things can be a model. It can be a model such as the spirit soul body model, where someone may consider where they're operating from. Someone might take a look at, okay, you know, this is what you want to do. Are you coming from will, you made a choice? Are you coming from mind, you're being logical? Are you coming from emotion? Are you just doing because you want to? So are you coming from will, mind, or emotion? Are you coming from a spiritual level? Are you coming from others? Are you coming from principles? Are you coming from religion? Are you coming from God? From where are you operating? It's a system of doing things. It can be a system of doing things. can be a systematic way of evaluating advice, such as using the four rules, the copper rule. Did you think through it? The silver rule. Did you focus on doing no harm? The golden rule, do you treat others the way you want to be treated? The platinum rule, do you treat others the way others want to be treated? So a system of doing things can be a very systematic way of evaluation. A system of doing things can be a way of doing analysis. <clears throat> so it could be the multi-directional analysis of the 4P360 leadership, where you're looking at a leadership approach by looking at it as leading down. Obviously, well, I'm, I'm the boss. I can tell them what I want to have them do. And, and you, all you think is one direction. But if you start to think in the other directions, like, okay, what's the up version of this? <clears throat> do I want my people I'm leading to just dictate up? Of course not. Probably not. So I go, okay, how are we going to manage that? How about a cross? Do you want to be led by peers? Diagonal down, diagonal up. Reverse leadership, self-leadership. And if you have, say, the seven-direction, multi-tiered system of evaluating leadership styles, evaluating leadership techniques, taking a multi-dimensional approach, a multi-directional approach to things as an application of the force, that can be a system of doing things. How are you going to teach your child a system, a system of doing things, a system of evaluating things, a process that they can follow, a set of techniques that they can apply? principles, values, a philosophy that they can walk in with to help them understand how do I do all of this. Even when it comes to concepts of biblical truth, which we're going to get into now in just a moment, what is your systematic way, your system of doing things you're going to teach your child in following Christ? Which brings us to the way, Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So as Jesus as the way, Jesus is the way, so certainly for Christians, part of the way, train up your children 
in the way he should go. Part of the way a child should go is salvation. Ideally, of course, I'm sure all of us would agree. That Jesus is the way, so part of the way is teaching our child, teaching our children, our sons and daughters, about our Christian faith. Now, there's an important key here. Modern generations are different than prior generations. Let's say that again. Modern generations are different than prior generations. Every generation says that. Chances are, if you've got teenagers, if you've got kids in the young 20s, they have said, or at the very least believe, like, Mom, Dad, you know, things are different now than they were when you were our age. And it's true. And when we were their age, things were different than when our parents were that age. And even though a lot of things were different, you know what? A whole bunch of things were the same, too. Really, the only thing that's different is technology. At a principal level, there's nothing new under the sun. But at a sp specific level, certainly the technological level, as far as where society is at any given moment, well, it's always different. It's always going to be different. And no matter what you know, we think it is right now, 10 years from now, it's not going to be exactly the same. It's going to keep on changing. But here's a big thing that's different in the modern generation. In the modern generation, parents are a much smaller source of information for our children. This thing called the Internet is transforming society. Now, I remember when I was a kid, if I had a problem, if I had a question, if I had something I didn't know anything about, we had a set of encyclopedias in the house. And I would try to figure out, okay, what would describe, you know, the, the thing I'd want to look up. And I'd go hunting through, okay, ABC, okay, I, this is the volume that I need. And I would look it up in this encyclopedia. And I'd get the one view that World Book or Encyclopedia Americana or Encyclopedia Britannica would be teaching. And then that's kind of my baseline. That's my starting point. Nowadays, the kids go online with whatever question they have on anything they want to find anything out about, and they can go into any search engine, type in any words connected to what they want to know, and get information. And sometimes the information they're going to get isn't the information we want them to get. And so when it comes to their faith, if they have a theological question, and they're not 100% sure that they totally believe our answer. They're not 100% sure that they totally buy into whatever pastor said, whatever Sunday school teacher said, whatever mom or dad says. And they go search that question. They can find any number of answers. And the ability to do that means that you don't know how many voices your child is hearing. You don't know how many voices or what voices are resonating with your child. Used to be, if you were growing up in a religious home and you didn't like it, you either liked it or you didn't like it. And if you didn't like it, you say, I don't like that. And you might try to reject it, but you didn't have a way of supporting your rejection, typically. Now, they can. And if they want to oppose you, they want to oppose pastor, if they want to oppose Sunday school teacher, they can go look stuff up online and sometimes come up with a better argument against your position than you have in support of it because you do believe it. It never occurred to you you'd have to argue the position. And so modern generations are different than prior generations for that reason. Now something that's also been true for a long time and is probably more true now than it has been in prior generations is more and more young adult Christians leave the faith. That as soon as they are old enough to make their own decision as to whether or not they go to church, once they're out of the home, so they're no longer going because it's a family tradition. They don't go because, well, that's what the family does. The family goes to church. Now it's their choice. And it's their decision. Do I really believe this? more and more are leaving the faith. They're leaving church. They stop going. Now, many still return when they become parents. And it remains to be seen how much this Internet generation will be returning. 
Because it used to be when they left, they just left because they didn't like it. They left because, oh, that's a family thing. Or they left because, oh, you know, that's just something that, you know, my parents made me do. Because, you know, it was, they thought it was good for me. Now when they leave, they can back up all the reasons why they are leaving. They can make an argument about why rejecting the faith of their youth is perfectly acceptable. How it's even more intellectually honest. How this is the actual smart thing to do. And so it remains to be seen right now in the early 21st century how well this generation will be returning to faith when they become parents. Now when I was born, my mother was 20 years older than me. And I remember growing up and that you could typically figure out how old a mother was by adding 20 to 22 years to the age of the oldest child. That's probably about how old mom was. And the average age that women were getting married back then was about 21. Well, nowadays, people are getting married in their late 20s. On average, about half of people who get married for the first time on their first wedding are in their late 20s, 27, 28 years old. By the time they have children, Whereas it might have been common to have children by the time you were 25, now people are having children in their 30s. So what this often means is, when someone left the faith at about the age of 18, in six or seven years, as they have a child, they might have that impulse of, well, you know, this will be good for the child, we need to get back in church, so we raise our child around moral people, around the, you know, our religious values, and people return to the religion of their youth. Well, you only gone for six or seven years. And even in between, you probably still went back for Easter. You probably still went back for Christmas. Well, if one of the classic prompts to return to the faith of your youth was having children, and now that's not happening until the 30s, imagine if someone has a child when they're 33. And the child is about that age that would normally prompt parents to want to return to the faith of their youth. Well, now, instead of just being absent for six or seven years, now they've been absent for 15 years. And now, instead of just being absent for the 15 years because they left because they didn't like it or they left because they didn't think it was all that important, now they had backed it up, they had justified, they had argued for it. And for the last 15 years of their life, their entire adult life, more life than they may even remember being a part of church, now they get this prompt, and we don't know if they will return to the faith of their youth. Many still do, but those numbers are dwindling. Now, what the point of all of this is, it's becoming increasingly important to help children really learn and understand their faith. So it's their own faith not just a family faith tradition. That as they can understand it, as they can grapple with it themselves, as they understand the reasons why, the reasons behind, so they're not just getting the conclusions in Sunday school, they're not just getting kind of the entertaining, you know, youth groupish level of involvement, but they're beginning to get good, solid understanding. This is what's true. This is why we believe this is what's true. And these are all of the logical reasons why rejecting this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because you see things and understand things. Not just you see things because we've told you the conclusion. Not just because we told you, well, it is because it is because it is because I know that I know that I know. So the child can believe it for themselves so that when they get older, they know that it's true. Not just that they've been told that it's true. And whether they like it or not, they still believe it because they've been taught why it's true. It's a different sort of teaching that worked in generations past. More and more now, we can't just teach conclusions. We have to support those conclusions with our points. And we have to be careful how we critique or criticize opposing points of view. Because if we say, well, this is right because ABC, 
The other people, they're, they're just stupid. They just don't read. They just don't care. And then they go check and say, well, no, you know, I checked the other side, and it seems like they read, and it seems like they do care. They disagree, and, and they have you know, ten reasons why they disagree. And so if one of the ways that, uh, you know, you said that, you know, this is true and that's not is because those people don't think, well, I don't know, that looks pretty thoughtful to me. You know, you said you, you know, that was just stupid. Well, I don't know, that looks pretty smart to me. So, well, they just don't read. Well, I was looking at it, and uh, it looks pretty thoroughly read to me. And so you want to make sure you have enough respect for opposing points of view so that when they meet people with opposing points of view, when they face those arguments head on, that they can understand the logic and the rationale. That's part of why we say we have a point. They may also have a point. If you want them to understand, yes, they have a point. This is why they believe what they believe. And what they believe makes sense. And you know, very smart, insightful, thoughtful people believe that. Here's what they're missing. And then you support your own position. I mean, this is one of the problems we run into very often when you're criticizing some other religion. So, well, all of those people, they're, they're carnal and, and, and you know, they're bad people. And then they meet some of them. You know, I don't know. They seem like pretty good people to me. So you want to help them really learn and understand in a way that allows them to fold in this outside information. New children must be prepared to deftly and comfortably incorporate more information into their faith and to handle more and more opposition to their faith. And to not do it in a conclusion-oriented, argumentative fashion, but one that honors and respects the people who have different points of view. So that you can engage your children in an intelligent discourse where the reality they encounter when they're outside matches up with what you told them reality was going to be. So on train up a child in the way. Train up a child in the way. And still talking about the way. We have martial arts. There's a, a phrase, michi, if it's by itself. Do, if it's added to the end of a word. The way here is a lifestyle martial arts path. Now, some martial arts use do kind of pretty loosely. It's supposed to be that jitsu is techniques and do is the way. It's kind of a loosely followed tradition. But some martial arts are do arts, roughly meaning the way. The idea behind it is that the art is not just a set of combat techniques, although it very often certainly is a set of combat techniques, but it's not just a set of combat techniques, but a way of life. When you consider how many ancient arts were taught and are still today practiced at temples and monasteries, this makes a great deal of sense. That it's a lot more than just, here's how you make a fist and here's how you throw a punch. Even outside the, the religious center, we often saw great power for violence brought under control of a code, such as the samurai and the knight, who were taught the ideals of Bushido, the ideas of chivalry. So the samurai had this ideal, and however imperfectly it was lived, they remained ideals, that these are the ideals of a samurai, the code of Bushido, the principles that are the foundation of Bushido of honor and duty and sincerity and generosity. The, the ideals of chivalry, of, of fair play and, and defending the ladies and courtesy and play even to one's enemies. And you know, today in the military that they have basic codes. And so what is a code that you teach your child? Do you have a code that you teach your child? So train up a child in the way he should go. Well, what about he should go? Well, one of the ways a child should go is fundamentals. Fundamentals to follow. Now, fundamentals to follow might be something like God, religion, principles, others, out of our spirit, soul, body model. That the fundamental to follow is, you know, you seek God. You know, you follow the tenets of, of your faith. That you walk out your life in principles and philosophy. That you walk out your life in, in service and support of other people. A fundamental to follow could be basic morality. The ethics that you enter into the world with. It could be traditions that you follow. Your fundamentals could follow could be just as simple as you know, celebrating Christmas. It doesn't have to be some great and lofty and some deep and powerful thing. It could be just some fairly simple fundamentals. And this is just how we do things here. 
he should go could also be according to his bent. Now, this is an, an incredibly powerful one. One's bent is talents, aptitudes, interests, desires, temperament, personality. What is in the direction that matches up with who your child is? If you have an enormously orderly child, what we call a precise temperament, your child might be very well suited to something like accounting. And that exact same child might be very poorly suited to drama. On the other hand, you could have a child who has a very playful temperament. Very creative, very artistic. And somebody who's creative and artistic and very often very disorganized might not have a very good bent toward accounting. And even if there's a family history of mom's an accountant, dad's an accountant, grandma and grandpa on both sides are all accountants. You need to be an accountant. Well, if a child just really does not have that temperament, trying to train up a creative, disorganized child to be an accountant might result in a not very good accountant. They did an interesting study of medical students, and, and what they found in medical students, they, they were trying to do a fairly simple analysis. Okay, why are some medical students really successful in med school, and why are some med students very poor in med school? Well, you know, what are some very obvious things? You know, like, what, what's their GPA like? What's their IQ like? What are their study habits like? And it was, you know, it's one of those mindless studies where you go like, okay, well, duh, obviously the smarter people are doing better and the not as smart people are doing poorly. Obviously the ones who study harder are doing better and the ones who aren't studying are doing worse. And as they did the first pass in the study, they found out that that wasn't actually the case. But you have some very, very smart med students who are doing very, very well, no surprise, and some very, very smart med students who were struggling. You had some medical students whose IQ wasn't as high even as some of the ones who were struggling, and they were excelling. Here's part of what ultimately they found out. The number one determining factor, at least in this particular study, was do they want to be a doctor? The more the individual medicine wanted to be a doctor for themselves, that's what they wanted, the better they did. The more they were doing it because someone else wanted them to be a doctor. They didn't want to be a doctor, but your mom's a doctor, dad's a doctor. We have a family history of doctors. Even if there's no family history of doctors, you know, well, your mom and dad always you know, said I should be a doctor. You know, I was always good at science, and you know, everyone, you know, they wanted a doctor in the family, and so I'm the one who had to go. And, and what they found is the biggest thing is, did you want to be a doctor? And so sometimes someone may have no interest in being a doctor, no desire to be a doctor, even if they have a talent for science, even if they may have an aptitude. So the, according to his bent is kind of combining all of these things to raise up a child, to cultivate what they're talented at, to cultivate their aptitudes, to cultivate their interests, to cultivate their desires. And there's a balancing act to be performed here because obviously they're going to need to be able to deal with their responsibilities. But part of the way a child should go is, well, what is the temperament of this child? What is the most natural for the child that we can bring out the best in this child? So rather than play right into a child's weakness, you may want to work on the weaknesses, but help a child learn what their strengths are and to play to their strengths. Train up a child in the way he should go, the way he should go could be the expected path. Now basic education to advanced education, you know, that's an expected path. So that's a way. And you might determine, well, this is a way that you should go. I mean, yet you have to do basic education. That's a mandatory part of the path. You're expected to follow the path through advanced education. You know, or you're expected to follow the path through, you know, medical school. But if, if you know, you're raising up your child in the expected path, what is the expected path for your child? You might raise up a child in the expected path of marriage, helping your child learn about relationship, because 90% of people historically get married, at least once. The expected path of parenting, about 80% of people grow up and have children. So are you preparing your child to be a parent? So train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. He will not depart from it is a principle, not a law. 
a principle, not a law. Now what that means is that it is often true, usually true, probably true, but not necessarily true. A law is like in physics. So if I have some object and I let it go, it is going to fall to the ground if it is more dense than the, the medium in which it is presently existing. So in the air, if something's lighter than the air, it's going to float like a helium balloon. And if it's heavier than air, it's going to drop like if I'm dropping a shot put. That's a law. That there's not going to be exceptions. Not that when I'm going to drop the shot put, and most of the time it's going to fall. Sometimes it's going to float. So when he is old, he will not depart from it is a principle. It's usually but not always true. Now, if we did a perfect job, if, if the parents were perfect and children learned and obeyed perfectly, then it would always work. But parents aren't perfect. It's a compass-heading ideal that we're pursuing, not a mathematically exact system to follow and a physics-precise response from children. Parents are not perfect. And even if the parents were perfect, success is not guaranteed. Success is not guaranteed. Now think about this for a second. Is God perfect? If you're a Christian, you would say, well, yes, of course, God is perfect. Take a look at how things worked out with Israel. So if you read your Old Testament, and you follow from, oh, around Exodus, all the way through Old Testament history, all the way into the New Testament, and see if God was the perfect parent, and if Israel was a theocracy, shouldn't therefore everything have worked out perfectly with Israel? And that would be a no. It didn't work out perfectly with Israel. And why is that? Is because the Israelites got to make up their own mind. Is Jesus perfect? Yes, Jesus is perfect. Then why isn't the church perfect? Is the Holy Spirit perfect? Yes, the Holy Spirit is perfect. Then why, if we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, are we not perfect? Because we get to make up our mind. So parents are not perfect, but even if you were, success is still not guaranteed. Any more than is guaranteed for God. And He is perfect. So we always have to remember, children make up their own mind. Even as children, think about it, did you ever... Make up your own mind on anything. Or did you just download whatever mom and dad said was always true? You had your own thoughts. You had your own opinions. You had opinions sometimes that might disagree. You may have argued with mom or dad over something. Children make up their own mind. Children may agree or disagree. Now, if they disagree, that doesn't give them the right to disobey if there's still minors living in your home. And that's something you know, I tell kids, is like, look, you are entitled to your own opinion. You're entitled to think of something, whatever you decide to think about something. You're entitled to feel however you feel. What you are not entitled to is disobedience. You are not entitled to disobedience. So it's okay, even as an adult. As an adult, is it okay to have an opinion different from your boss? Yeah. Is it okay to not like what your boss is telling you to do. Yeah. So what happens if you're disobedient to your boss? Well, you'll probably get fired. And so this is adult life, too. This isn't even just child life. But regardless, with children, until they are legal adults and supporting themselves, they do have a duty to obey. And a wise parent will kind of be loosening the reins as the children get older. And certainly will have much fewer rules if you have an adult child you're still supporting and an adult child still living in your home. But we also need to remember, when our children become adults, as our children are independent, they will be making their own choices. Adult children are adults. And that means that their choices, once they become adults, are up to them. So train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Lots of train. What that means, how you do that. Lots of the way. What the way is. He should go. And how that's going to show up. And when he is old, he will not depart from it as a principle. 
that if we have a very self-consistent and adequately supporting in our training of our child in the way they should go, backing it up so that they don't get sucked off the path later on as adults, so that they understand it as they internalize the way we've arrived at the path, then when they face opposition, temptation, pulls in different direction, even if for a season they may drift from the path, as they get older, as they get more mature, they will return to, hopefully, the way they should go. So happy Mother's Day. Have a fantastic day. In the next two weeks, we're going to take exactly the same verse and apply it to self-leadership. So whether you're a mother or a father, you've been listening to this lesson next week and the week after that, we are going to take this exact same verse and the exact same principles and we're going to see how it shows up in our own lives, how in a very real sense we can be like our own parents. We're adults, we get to make up our own mind. And how this exact same verse provides guidance to us as adults. So that's in the next two weeks, so we'll see you back for that. And have a great Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Thank you.